Hello everyone and welcome to my channel where my goal is for you to become your own authority in health and today we'll be starting a new series entitled Insights and Commentary on Popular Books and today we'll be discussing Eat for Life by Dr. Joel Fuhrman. Now this uh, series of videos is basically going to be mind mapping the ideas of a book, not actually the layout of the book necessarily, but using mind map as a way of looking at the basic ideas and drawing some conclusions based on those and to present the ideas of the author in a clear way, not as a substitute for reading the book. In fact, I think reading this book would be valuable, not just for the material, some of which we'll be discussing, but for the recipes, because diets such as this are very important. They're basically very important for you to use the recipes if you're going to do this because unless you have the recipes you're not going to be successful in incorporating an entire new way of eating so the recipes by far if you ask me in terms of implementation of these ideas is more important than the ideas of course understanding that is understanding the ideas is important and we'll go through some of those but if you don't have a concrete plan and you wish to try this plan, then you really need to buy the book. So I highly recommend that, and it's also good to support authors. So we'll be breaking this book down up by these categories. The Nutritarian Diet, which is basically what the diet of Dr. Joel Furman is called. Ideas in preventing cancer, in terms of how the Nutritarian Diet helps that. Weight loss, reversing disease, and ideas of cooking and eating. So let's jump right into the Nutritarian Diet and discuss a little bit of an introduction to this diet. So why go on a nutritarian diet? And Dr. Furman answers it very simply. He feels as though you do not have to be sick. And of course, he's mostly talking about chronic health diseases, and those do make up most of, of what people are dealing with. The nutritional excellence that he describes in this book can prevent and even reverse most medical problems within three to six months. And I must say, just as commentary, that I have implemented this diet in my medical practice and have found it to be one of the most potent disease-reversing diets that I have ever seen. I have a lot of autoimmune patients who have gone on the nutritarian diet and the autoimmune protocol and various other diets that are supposed to reverse autoimmune disease, as one example, and have found the nutritarian diet to be far and away the most effective if people have a plan of attack to actually go on this diet. He feels as though all of us are victims of food in the standard American diet. And like classic victims, we grew up to love the things that were killing us, in this case, the food. Understanding going through a specific diet and the yo-yo dieting bandwagon that all of us tend to be on is important because each time we lose weight and regain it, we build up more plaque in our arteries and increase visceral fat more than other types of fat. And an important idea to understand that we've spoken about in other videos on this channel is that visceral fat, the fat around your organs, it's not just sitting there. It is a biologically active organ, if you can think about it that way. It's releasing what are called inflammatory cytokines, these things that actually increase the overall net inflammation in your body. So if you're continuing to pack on every time you gain weight and lose weight and gain weight and lose weight, a little bit more visceral fat, you're slowly increasing the amount of visceral fat, which is going to increase the inflammation in your body and cause you to have problems with blood sugar regulation, cholesterol levels, uh, a whole host of things that happen when this inflammation goes up and you have this metabolically active fat that's sitting around your organs. Very important to get rid of that, and I've spoken about that many times in other videos on this channel. The underlying theory of the nutritarian diet is that the foods with the highest micronutrients per calorie are vegetables, and for optimal health and to combat disease, it is necessary to consume an adequate amount of ver and variety of vegetables. And we'll be talking more about this nutrients per calorie, but if you keep in mind and you think about how Vegetables don't really have that many calories, but they're loaded with nutrients. And we'll go through what those nutrients are as we proceed through the ideas in this book. The mindset and strategies are that your choices are based on nutrient density and quality. So I've spoken a lot on this channel about how each and every day you should be looking to increase the quality of the food that you're eating and the quality of all the things that you're doing, quite frankly, because all of us are on a mission 
to slowly improve our health, to gain control over our health, to become our own authority in health, as I like to say. Your primary objective should be to obtain long-lasting, excellent health, and weight loss happens as a result of this goal and is important, but not the main goal. I must say that this is not necessarily the goal of all people. Now, some people, their goal really is to optimize muscle growth and what they consider to be optimal performance. That may not be consistent with long-lasting and excellent health in, in the sense of longevity. And his idea and his plan and his strategy, I guess you could say, is that we want to put ourselves in a situation that is going to lead to a long life with excellent health. You don't have to count calories here, measure portions, or weigh yourself regularly. You can eat as much food as you want, and over time, you'll become satisfied with fewer calories. This is an eating style that you will learn to enjoy forever. Now, this often is something, when I mention that, that people don't quite understand. And when you're eating food that is very high nutrient density, then you're not going to be eating things that are going to be very, very high calorie, and therefore you don't have to count calories. You'll understand how this is so as we go through the rest of the ideas in the book, but suffice it to say that, again, if you're basing your choices on nutrient density and quality, uh, especially nutrient density, it's going to be hard to actually eat so much that you're going to gain weight, and therefore you also are going to lose weight. In addition, one of the ideas in the book really is that amazingly that when you're flooding your system with the beneficial plant ingredients, you're actually satisfied with fewer calories. So you're flooding your system with all these beneficial chemicals, and we'll go through all those, what they are as we go through, your appetite will decrease and you won't need as many calories. What is the potential here? The potential is tremendous. And of course, he's treated thousands upon thousands of patients. Uh, the therapeutic potential is reversing autoimmune disease, early stage cancers, even help with late stage cancers, and also inspiring hope. And some of that hope is that you have some control and some plan over your overall health. And as I said, I've had many patients, uh, especially lupus and psoriasis patients who've gone on this diet who have had remarkable turnarounds. Some of them, the condition doesn't go away completely, but it proves so dramatically that we've been able to get people off of medication, off of systemic medications that were very dangerous and able to manage it topically, in fact, uh, several of these cases. <clears throat> also, reaching a healthy weight will be pleasant. Uh, this is sort of realizing the potential of what this diet can do and can be an automatic byproduct that occurs naturally in the road to maximizing your health. So what are the, what are the claims that he makes? Well, he claims that the nutritarian diet it has more weight loss than any other diet, more cholesterol lowering than any other diet, more blood pressure lowering than any other diet, more diabetes reversal than any other diet, and more reductions in craving and hunger than any other diet. So very bold claims, and he has, does have, a, I believe, one or two studies that he actually uh, wrote up and got published in regards to this. I must say that one of the most satisfying things for me, uh, putting people on this diet, I've certainly put people on many other diets, but of this diet in particular, is that I've had all kinds of disease, re diabetes reversal, you know, and that's not something, obviously, that, that I am usually involved in in my specialty but i've been able to re to reverse diabetes i've had people i had one woman who had macular degeneration reversal uh, certainly gotten people off of blood pressure lowering um, medication off of you know blood pressure medications off of statins and it it's really one of the most satisfying things for me to be able to get people off of medications for sure so that is the potential. So let's talk about the four principles of the nutritarian diet. Principle number one is the only proven strategy for slowing aging and prolonging lifespan is moderate calorie restriction in the environment of mac micronutrient excellence. We'll talk a little bit more about this and also just to emphasize that longevity is one of the foundations here that he is trying to go for, that he wants people to live as long as possible. Number two, a diet has to be hormonally favorable to enable maximal 
lifespan. The third principle is optimal exposure to all macro and micronutrients humans require is needed to maximize health and lifespan. This is called comprehensive nutrient adequacy. We'll go through that in detail. And the fourth principle is synthetic chemicals, toxins, pathogenic bacteria, parasites, and other disease-causing substances should be avoided. And we've spoken about that at length on this channel. So let's jump into principle number one, where we're trying to understand how it is that one, you can essentially live with with moderate calorie restriction when you're able when you are eating enormous quantities of micronutrients so what are the three factors that slow aging uh, let me close some of these down so it's a little clearer so what are the three factors that most slow aging per dr. Furman they are <clears throat> the nutritarian diet, moderate calorie restriction, and exercise. The nutrient nutritarian diet is classified by this equation that he came up with uh, many years ago, which is health equals nutrients over calories. So the more nutrients per calorie, the higher the health life expectancy. And there are several methods of scoring nutrient density. You'll see one actually at Whole Foods. Uh, at least they used to display the Andy score. And this was something that I believe that Dr. Furman actually came up with and was adopted by Whole Foods. Uh, and the Andy score basically ranked the nutrient value of many common foods on the basis of how many nutrients they deliver to your body for each calorie consumed. So things like cruciferous vegetables, as an example, because they're loaded with micronutrients, but they are low in calories, would have a very high nutrient value. Now, there are other people who crit critics of this particular scoring because it basically looks mostly at, at phytonutrients. And sometimes people would say that there are certain animal products like liver that's loaded with um, fat-soluble vitamins should have a higher score. Um, Nonetheless, uh, this has proved to be a valuable way of at least looking at the micronutrient density of plant foods. But Dr. Furman has actually updated the scale because honestly, you're not going to live on kale only, and he wanted it to be based on portions. So the portions, if you look at it from a portion perspective, then it makes a little bit more sense. So the nutrient, the updated rating, this nutrient IQ score, is based on portion sizes of foods ra eaten rather than calories. So it can be practically utilized to track the quality of one's diet. The foods that have a high nutrient IQ score are straight from nature, primarily vegetables, legumes, and fruits. And because of phytochemicals, phyto meaning plant and chemicals, of course, in the in the plant are largely unnamed and unmeasured, these rankings may underestimate the healthful properties of colorful natural plant foods. I'll provide a link in this video to one of my Wednesday Night Live classes where we discussed how there are just, you know, a few hundred that have phytochemicals that have actually been studied at length that have very specific <clears throat> benefits to them. And there is, there are probably something of the order of 20 to 30,000 phytochemicals that have yet to be named. And so these rankings, as he's saying, is, may underestimate the healthful properties of these plant foods. So you do not have to score foods and keep track of points to eat a nutritarian diet, but the idea in general is valuable to just the overall thinking of your diet, and sort of the on-the-spot evaluation of what's in front of you that you're eating. Dr. Furman has come up with this G-BOMBS acronym, which is a acronym for greens, beans, onions, mushrooms, berries, and seeds. And he feels as if you eat each of these per day, you're getting all the micronutrients that is going to ensure optimal health. Let's move on to the next part of the number one principle. Our nutrients are basically broken down can be broken down into macronutrients and micronutrients. Macronutrients, of course, are fats, carbohydrates, protein, and water. And a lot of people out there are looking for some magic ratio of fats to carbohydrates to protein. And Dr. Furman would certainly respond that that is less important 
then ensuring that you get the most micronutrients that per calorie in your diet as we've discussed. So let's talk a little bit about what micronutrients are. They're basically vitamins, minerals, antioxidants, and phytochemicals. Uh, they're chemical compounds found in plants. And they do not contain calories. Calories are coming from other parts of the plant. And his diet is such that you want to focus on micronutrients. You want to focus on those foods. So let's talk a little bit about these micronutrients. We'll do a highlight on carotenoids, another highlight on flavonoids, as well as um, just some ideas about special, special note on grains and why healthy soil makes healthy people. So let's move into micronutrients. So what are the, fun the functions of micronutrients? Well, they aid in detoxifying carcinogens and removing toxins from the body. They essentially act in the liver to help the process of moving through the different stages of detoxification. So your, your liver does many things. One of the things it does, of course, is to detoxify foreign chemicals. And it does that by adding and subtracting different things to the toxins so that it can be excreted from your body. And in the process of doing this, you need to have micronutrients to be able to help uh, enzymes to, to do this sort of process. It also repairs DNA damage, and it reduces free radical formation. And we'll talk more about that. But basically, the normal process of your body is somewhat costly in terms of your health, believe it or not. You get what's called free radicals, and these free radicals get produced just from natural metabolism. And this is just the way it goes with with our our process it's like burnt when you're burning fuel on a fire you get smoke and you get toxins that are released the same thing happens in your body when you're processing your calories and part of the damage that is done can be reversed from having micronutrients in your diet the nutrient density in your body's tissues is proportional to the nutrient density of your diet you are what you eat, in other words. And you can have a lot more nutrient density in your tissues. These phytochemicals and phytonutrients that we're talking about will be deposited in your tissues. Uh, in carot carotenoids, as an example, like beta carotene, you know, some people who drink a lot of carrot juice or eat a lot of vegetables, even in this diet, can they can actually have a little bit of an orange hue to their skin because those are being deposited in the skin. That's not a negative thing. And we'll talk about that uh, as we go through. The higher, nu the higher nutritional quality of your diet, the less you will desire to overconsume calories. So when you're getting a diet that's amazingly nutrient dense, you have a decrease in your appetite in the sense that you're not going to have pathological, abnormal desires to overconsume calories. When we're eating nutrient poor foods, like flowers, uh, you know, uh, like white flour or really a, a lot of different kinds of, of grains that are ground into flour and white rice and potatoes, even though potatoes do have a decent, you know, more nutrition than most people think, still, nonetheless, the more nutrient density, the higher the nutritional quality of your diet, the less you will desire to overconsume these calories. The foods we consume throughout our lives are the largest factor determining our health destiny. And I would just say that for chronic health disease like heart disease, high blood pressure, diabetes, that, that is true. I will say though that in, in my on my channel, of course, we focus on the four pillars of health. One of course is nutrition, the others are mental state, environmental influences, and movement mechanics. These, for there are some people that their mental state is going to overcome all the benefits, unfortunately. Uh, that each, each of us have one pillar that is more consequential. But when it comes to chronic health disease that we're talking about, as I said, talking about diabetes, type 2 di diabetes, type 2 diabetes, heart disease, high blood pressure, metabolic syndrome, you know, as, as it's been described, there's no question that food is pl plays an oversized role. So let's talk about carotenoids. And one way to think of carotenoids, think of that we spoke about carrots. You can think about it. Remember that carrots have it, have carotenoids, uh, but they're also found in lots of other things. And what they do is they scavenge for those free radicals, sort of the smoke and the soot that is a consequence of natural processing of your food. So let's talk about that a little bit more and have a little bit better understanding of, of carotenoids. So what can we say about carotenoids in lifespan? 
while population studies show an association between high dietary intake of carotenoid-containing fruits and vegetables and reduced risk of lung, prostate, breast, and head and neck cancers. In fact, the, there are many, many studies that that have looked at this, and I think it's it's pretty it's a pretty good open and shut case in terms of showing this association. Uh, highest blood levels of alpha, beta, and beta cryptoxanthin were each linked to a 5 to 8% increase in telomere length. Uh, there's companies out there that will test your tel telomere length as a way of looking at your longevity. And I'm not sure how effective the, those tests are. In fact, I don't recommend them. But there's nonetheless, we do know that as your telomeres, the ends of your DNA, start to shrink, that is associated with, with, with aging. And if you can increase telomere length, then that is logically going to increase potentially the length of your life. Uh, at least it's a marker for aging that is being affected. Lutein and xanthine are also carotenoids. And um, I was going to break up this review, as you can see here. Um, but essentially, what we're talking about here is lutein and xanthine. You, they're often um, used in vitamins for the eyes. You probably have seen some commercials on that because they have a special capability to filter blue light. And blue light is a component of sunlight. And although we need blue light exposure during daylight times to regulate our circadian rhythms, too much blue light can result in oxidative damage to the macula. It's found in leafy greens like spinach and collards, and it's linked to age-related macular degeneration. And as I stated earlier, I had a patient who I put on a, a diet, very, pretty much this diet, with the exception that um, she, was, I allowed her to have some of her favorite sardines. Uh, but essentially, she was eating an enormous amount of leafy greens, and this was new to her. And her macular degeneration, I got a call from her ophthalmologist, amazingly, and he said, I don't know what you're doing, but this is one of the most amazing reversals of macular degeneration I've ever seen. And that was that was really exciting, both for me and, of course, for, for my patient. It also prevents skin damage from exposure to UV light. So I, I have noticed in my practice that people who are eating enormous amounts of of leafy green vegetables, even with a lot of sun damage, they seem to have less incidence of skin cancer. Of course, that's completely anecdotal, and I don't have any study to, to back that up, just my clinical observation. What about in the heart, heart blood vessels and brain protection? Well, lycopene is also a carotenoid. And lycopene, we've, we may, you may have heard of that, um, but it has some really interesting properties. It helps prevent LDL oxidation. A lot of people now are saying that it's not really LDL per se that is the problem. It's oxidized LDL. LDL. And this prevents LDL oxidation. It also inhibits HMG-CoA reductase, which is what statins do. And as a result, Believe it or not, one cup of tomato juice or three to four tablespoons of tomato paste, lycopene is concentrated deeply in tomato paste, was reported to reduce LDL cholesterol by 10%. This is dramatic, absolutely dramatic, to be able to get such reduction. Uh, supplements don't work. Supplements don't work. In fact, beta-carotene studies, just isolated beta-carotene, was shown to have an increase in lung cancer risk, especially in smokers. And so I spoke about this uh, in one of my Wednesday Night Live classes where we spoke about supplements. So if you want to hear more about the ins and outs of supplements and why trying to duplicate nature can be a problem and how to pick supplements for yourself, watch uh, I'll put a, a link to that video in the in the uh, show notes. Two weeks of lycopene, a tomato-rich lycopene diet, improved endothelial function, the health of the inside of the lining of blood vessels, and this was related to antioxidant effects. Other people out there, some people with autoimmune disease, or people on, say, plant paradox diet who are trying to avoid nightshades and lectins, there are other foods that have lycopene. These are guava, watermelon, and pink grapefruit. Okay, so what are the key points that we should think about when it comes to carotenoids? Well, 
absorption of these vegetables is low because they're bound into the fiber in the matrix of the vegetable. So you want to be able to grate, juice, blend, cook. Uh, in this case, they are not destroyed by heat and add some fat because they're basically fat soluble and therefore a little bit of fat. This could be in the form of some nuts or uh, anything really, or some seeds. Anything is going, to, anything with a little bit of healthy fat, we'll talk about fat a little bit later, is going to increase the absorption. But if you don't open the, the cell by grating, juicing, blending, or cooking, you're not going to get the best absorption. Okay, now let's, we've spoken about carotenoids, let's move on to flavonoids. So flavonoids include things like green tea, uh, berry anthocyanins, soy isoflavones, cocoa flavanols, and citrus flavin flavanones. They also have antioxidant activity, like, like we spoke about with carotenoids, where they can actually scavenge for free radicals, but they also have a critical role in protecting mitochondrial DNA. Now that's the powerhouse of your cell, these little uh, bacteria-like, actually, little things that live inside your cell that act as sort of the powerhouse of the cell. And, but they're not essentially dietary antioxidants themselves. So uh, they're working through different mechanisms. They enhance autophagy, which is where your body is able to recycle the old parts of the cell. I've used the analogy of an old train where you're basically taking out the old chairs and putting in new chairs. That's what's sort of happening with autophagy where you're actually recycling parts of the inside of the cell and therefore you're taking out old parts and releasing them with new help with no2 production with which is good for vasodilation opening your blood vessels activates uh, nrf2 which is a, a feature that we'll talk about a little bit later but is associated with longevity helps bind excess copper and iron so both of these if you get them wrong if you get them in high levels, can be very damaging to the body. And they also have anti-diabetic effects, specifically rutin, which is a flavonoid, camphorol, and quercetin. Quercetin's been, of course, in the news lately because it can be helpful with your immune system. People with uh, during this COVID crisis have been increasing their intake of quercetin. And also helpful with synaptic plasticity, which is associated with improved cognitive function in adults. So you're going to want to also get flavonoids into your system. So we've spoken about micronutrients. We've highlighted carotenoids and flavonoids. Now let's talk a little bit about healthy soil very briefly. Unfortunately, we're dealing with a problem these days. And that is that modern farming methods have resulted in the loss of half the topsoil of the earth in the last 150 years. And without having soil quality, the overall antioxidant levels in produce, as well as the mineral content, is low. So organic agriculture and buying and supporting organic agriculture is going to be helpful for the future of human health in general, as well as enhancing soil quality and biodiversity. Regenerative agriculture is even better, but Dr. Furman has really one takeaway from this. To be healthy, you have to eat at least 90% of your diet from an assortment of nutrient-rich, colorful plants. The health benefits of regularly eating vegetables and fruits far outweigh the potential negatives of the reality of pesticide residue in plants. However, in light of what we know about, pest that, about how pesticides can harm us, it is optimal to eat mostly organic foods and foods grown in high quality soils as much as possible. Doing this, we support our own health, our planet, and our planet's people the best way we can. So we end this section on a special note on whole grains. Whole grains are a bit of a controversial topic when it comes to, quote, the, the diet wars and how some people are way against whole grains in general, but Dr. Furman makes a few a few comments here. First is that wheat flour, semolina, durum wheat, organic flour, stone ground flours, and enriched, enriched wheat flour are not whole grains. So this is an incredibly important point, uh, point, if you ask me, because some people think if you get whole wheat flour, somehow you're eating whole grains. That's not not the case. And on the other side of it, some people think that all grains are 
a problem in any way. And I think there should be some distinction, and I think Dr. Furman makes a very good one. When you buy commercial flowers, even whole wheat flour, its innards are not kept fresh like those of an intact grain. So it's oxidized, and it has a higher glycemic load compared with the whole intact grain. The whole intact grain of wheat would be a wheat berry, basically. And whole wheat pastry flour is even worse because it's ground even more finely and is therefore more glycemic. In other words, when you're grinding the flour into this fine particle, it's like mainlining this into your bloodstream, and your blood sugar is going to go through the roof. It's going to be a terrible for you. Uh, intact grains, however, are not going to do that. And examples of these would be wheat berries, steel cut oats, quinoa, buckwheat, barley, millet, teff, amaranth, but not brown rice. And the reason for not brown rice is basically because of issues with arsenic and the fact if, if a field was used for cotton farming, apparently there is a higher level of arsenic. And I think all of us remember about a year and a half ago, a lot of studies showing that a lot of the brown rice on the market had a lot of arsenic. So he no longer recommends brown rice. Uh, if it was perfect without arsenic, I suppose he would be recommending it. Now, there are many people who would say that there are problems, including things like lectins in, in all of these things that are found in the intact grain to prevent digestion and that can irritate the gut. That would be the subject of another talk in general. But Dr. Furman is fully in support of whole grains, primarily because you can distinguish between intact grains and things that are processed. And also, there are epidemiological studies to show that there is some benefit to incorporating grains in your diet. Now, a lot of people will not take some of these epidemiological studies seriously, but a lot of Dr. Furman's ideas are based on these epidemiological studies and, of course, based on his clinical research and clinical, I should say, clinical expertise. We'll talk a little bit more about that as we get into the next section. So we've spoken about nutrients. Let's move on to the food matrix. And this is a complicated structure of whole foods with a unique combination of nutrients, fiber, and biochemical architecture. He's essentially stressing the fact that eating whole foods is going to come with a whole bunch of things that can't be duplicated and can't be manipulated in ways to, to you know, they, they become, they have a complicated structure that you need to think about it as sort of a food matrix. And he classifies foods into different categories, produce, whole grains, processed foods, and animal products. Of course, produce is all those vegetables, whole grains, he means, well, could be intact grains as well as processed, processed foods and animal products. Let's talk about how he defines aging. Well, there's a study of aging, and you can watch one of my Wednesday night live classes on the, the science of aging. I believe I did too, and I'll leave a, com I'll leave a link below for that. Uh, basically, study of aging is understanding the cumulative effects of multiple pathways of damage that happen as a result of natural metabolic processes, environmental influences, and programmed immune system decline. And as we're exposed to more waste products and toxins, we age faster. If we don't supply the micronutrients, our bodies need to neutralize and remove them. We're essentially talking a little bit about what we've already discussed. We spoke about telomere length, and that gets worse with oxidative stress, those free radicals that we spoke about. Lower BMI is going to be associated with a with anti-aging biology. In other words, here we are, what would make your biology in a, in a way more anti-aging? High circulating carotenoids, we spoke about that. And he really has been fundamental in this idea that slower metabolism is really a feature of anti-aging biology. A lot of people who are on weight loss plans, they, they wanna speed up their metabolism. But there's really no evidence that higher metabolism is associated with good health. In fact, a faster metabolic rate means faster energy turnover, like a bigger fire, a faster fire, that's creating greater production of free radicals, which leads to increased oxidative damage and more potential for disease. In fact, researchers observed that for each 100 calorie increase in 24-hour resting metabolic rate, the risk of premature death increased by 25 to 
So this notion of increasing metabolism is somehow being optimal for your overall health. Maybe it helps with weight loss in specific when specifically done, but that doesn't mean it's going to ensure an anti-aging biology. And that's what he's really focusing on here. So the resting metabolic rate is a feature of various different things, Ca genetics, calorie intake, and exercise. So what about exercise? Well, that does raise total calorie expenditure. It raises the amount of calories you use, but it does not raise the body's basal metabolism. It's, it's just underlying level of metabolism. Therefore, it's the only safe way to, quote, raise metabolism because it activates the peripheral tissues to utilize more calories and increases muscle mass, which in turn increases total calorie expenditure. It's been shown that exercise promotes longevity. So the goal is to eat so healthfully that your desire to overeat is reduced. Uh, we've spoken about that before, as well as your metabolism a bit. You will comfortably desire less food without getting too thin. My nutritarian recommendations actually make you feel more satisfied with less food. Again, emphasizing that point over and over again, that you'll feel satisfied with less calories because you are eating nutrient-dense food and give you the ability to enjoy food more without overeating. I think this is a very important point because um, all of you have heard, I'm sure all of you have heard people talk about boosting your metabolism with various things. And I believe Dr. Furman is right on with this. I really do. Um, let's move on. Nutritarian diet, better than the blue zone diets? So what's a blue zone diet? These are areas in the world that have produced cultures whose members live the longest. The diets in these regions all share similar traits. They're high in plant-based foods and extremely low in animal products. Now, people have various views on blue zones. And I'm not going to go into that too deeply. But I would like to say that some people think that there are obviously some cultural and exercise issues. You know, they're more active. They have more, um, more family ties. There are various things that contribute to that. Now, he believes that a nutritarian diet is different in that it takes the dietary practice from the blue zones a step further. farther. It utilizes the important lessons learned from the blue zones in conjunction with the most important recent scientific discoveries on aging, lifespan, and the power of particular foods and food ingredients to protect against cancer and later life cellular senescence that leads to premature aging and chronic disease. A nutritarian approach improves upon the blue zone diets, making it even more lifespan favorable. All I can say about this is it's really hard for anyone to guarantee that they're able to improve on any particular diet because there are so many factors that lead to overall health. We spoke about the four pillars that I often speak about on this channel, and I would I would caution anyone to to say that they've improved upon the blue zone diets uh, unless a uh, formal study is, is done. Of course, he has clinical experience and of people living a long life with his diet, but there are too many unknown factors to be able to say that that one diet has essentially improved on a particular diet. The standard American diet contains only 2% of calories from vegetables, food group, food group most linked to a longer lifespan and protection from heart disease and cancer. For a diet to be healthful, at least 90% of its calories should come from vegetables, fruits, legumes, nuts, seeds, and intact whole grains. This eating style is consistent with that found in the blue zones. So again, uh, you can see things that are repeating, 90% of your calories should come from, again, what he suggests remembering is that G-bombs, mnemonic, uh, greens, berries, onions, mushrooms, um, berries, and seeds. And they should make up part of your diet each and every day. Okay, let's close this down and move on to the next section. We've spoken about aging, we've spoken about classifications and various different things to emphasize principle number one, which is slowing aging and prolonging lifespan by moderate consumption moderate calorie consumption with lots of micronutrients. Let's move on to principle number two, and that is diet has to be hormonally favorable to enable lifespan, maximal lifespan. So we're going to talk about 
the hormonal consequences of excess fat, estrogen, insulin, and IGF-1. Uh, he's been talking about IGF-1 more than uh, more for more years, I would say, than really any other doctor out there. And we'll get into all the details here uh, as we go through it. So, what are the hormonal consequences of excess fat? Well, it's a risk factor for many diseases. We know this, and particularly the hormonally sensitive cancers, such as breast or prostate cancer via the enhanced production of estrogen for fat cells. Fat cells live in a low oxygen environment, and as a result, produce and shed more free radicals, creating an environment of chronic inflammation. In fact, these reactive oxygen species, cytokines, which are these inflammatory markers, and lipokines, stimulate aromatase, which increases estrogen levels in the body and even higher levels within the breast tissue. So this body fat, in addition, is poorly perfused with blood vessels, so you get chronic inflammation within the fat cells, further increases insulin resistance, which in turn increases insulin requirements, and then insulin levels. So since insulin is a growth hormone, then you're going to be getting uh, fat storage and cellular replication, as well as higher levels that, produce, that further promote tumor growth and angiogenesis. What about estrogen? I'm going to go through these relatively quickly because we have a lot of other things to discuss. Estrogen is a collective name for a group of hormones that promote and regulate the development of sex characteristics. In humans, in females, this includes breasts, endometrium, and menstrual cycles. In males, estrogen regulates the maturation of sperm and the sex drive. And a person with excess body fat is going to lead to local estrogen levels that are much, as much as tenfold higher so we've got, for breast cancer, cancer causing elements, you've got these inflammatory compounds, excessive estrogen because of the of fat, excessive insulin, excessive IGF-1, all creates a situation for precancerous changes. And this is a good, good thing, good diagram. Basically says obesity, not enough oxygen, remember the poorly perfused, which is going to lead to cellular proliferation, angiogenesis, and potentially breast cancer. Same thing, we spoke about how obesity is pro-inflammatory, increasing inflammation, which is going to increase insulin and IGF-1. Same thing. The fat has this aromatase activation, which is also going to increase estrogen and also increase cellular proliferation and new blood vessels or angiogenesis and also potentially lead, or at least create an environment that could lead to breast cancer. So it, this uh, excess fat, it, stimulates excess production of estrogen. And remarkably, mushrooms have natural aromatase inhibitors, and therefore that's why he includes them in his G-bombs mnemonic that should be eaten on a daily basis. And I must say that uh, I haven't mentioned it, but you don't have to. A lot of these problems that we're dealing with go away even before you've lost all the weight. Some of the hormonal consequences that we're talking about will actually improve within a couple of weeks of changing your diet. And that is something to keep in mind because I don't want you to feel as though, you know, you're automatically in this situation until you reach, you know, your ideal body weight. A lot of the changes happen literally within weeks when you start to increase the nutrient density of your diet. Let's talk a little bit about insulin and excess insulin is another critical factor contributing to the development and progression of cancer. Studies have reported that an increased risk of cancer in people with obesity and type 2 diabetes, especially those taking insulin, because once you take insulin, you're basically taking what's essentially a growth hormone and is going to cause, unfortunately, increased obesity and, and you know, this need for, for having, unfortunately, it's very difficult to get off of insulin once you get on insulin, and then it becomes sort of a vicious spiral. So food factors in insulin. Let's close this down. And let's talk a little bit about saturated fat, nuts versus oils, carbohydrate hierarchy, and resistant starch. And important, you know, to understand these things. First of all, saturated fat can worsen insulin resistance because increasing, in, it, increasing insulin secretion further in response to ingested carbohydrates. Um, because of the worsening insulin resistance, because there's actually a change in the receptor 
uh, for insulin when you basically are eating a, a high saturated fat meal. A lot of people will. Uh, well, I'm not going to get into the politics of saturated fat, but suffice it to say that it does interfere with the receptor that is uh, distorts the ability of insulin to bind to the cell's receptors. So if you combine saturated fat with high glycemic foods, there is an excess in insulin response, which promotes fat storage and excess cell replication and growth. So if you're eating something with saturated fat, make it essentially make it a low carb meal is essentially that's not what he's recommending here but i can tell you that there are many studies to show that the saturated fat becomes a lot more damaging to you if you're eating steak and potatoes the potatoes should be removed so if you're going to eat a, a, something with saturated fat whether you're going to have a big steak or whatever the case may be of course dr Furman would be against that but if you're going to be eating that please make it a low carb meal if you choose to be eating saturated fat because it's the combination that is really causes most of the damage. Uh, excess dietary fatty acids cause inflammation in the part of the brain called the hypothalamus and disrupt satiety signaling so which is basically if you feel how you how well how full you feel. Um, so this perpetuates the vicious cycle of overeating inflammation and more insulin resistance promoting disease and type 2 diabetes. And what about nuts versus oils? Oils are rapidly absorbed, and rapidly absorbed fats can be stored quickly as body fat. So he's actually not in favor even of using olive oil uh, because it's so absorbed, and also because it's 120 calories per tablespoon. So you can get an enormous number of calories very, very quick. A fat on the, from nuts, on the other hand, enters the bloodstream so slowly that appetite can be suppressed for many hours, and some are not absorbed at all. In other words, uh, there have been studies to show that when you eat nuts, some of it just gets taken right out of your system in your, in your stool. So this slow release of calories allows them to be used as fuel and not stored immediately as fat like, olo like oils can be. Uh, now there's, again, talking about these sort of diet wars and trying to understand carbohydrates. First of all, there is nuance to everything. And if you don't understand the levels of, of carbohydrates and how it's not just carbohydrates, obviously sugar and uh, is going to be worse than other types of, of carbohydrates. So there's a, this notion of a carbohydrate hierarchy. And we'll go through that uh, briefly. Maybe not so briefly, but <laughs> let me uh, close, okay. So what are the factors that make high fiber foods good or bad for your health? Let's talk about that. Essentially, it comes down to three, three things generally. Fiber, it's got a lot of fiber, then that's going to be uh, good. Resistant starch, also quite good. We'll talk a little bit about that later. And phytochemical load, we know about that now. We've spoken deeply about that already, that we want to have the most nutrients per calorie, and that's going to be your phytochemical load. The scientific literature has been very clear that high glycemic processed foods are so disease causing that they promote heart disease even more than saturated fats from animal products. So he's saying here clearly that these things that make your blood sugar spike and are, you know, things like flours that we spoke about, even whole wheat flour, these processed things with sugar are more disease promoting than than saturated fats so we have to be careful about that and it's uh it's nice that he said that only because again he, he has a more of a plant-based perspective and unfortunately you'll find people who would you'll find some books and some vegan influencers who ignore this fact because they don't want to be seen as somehow not towing the party line when it comes to saturated fats and how um, they are the devil. Of course, there are problems with saturated fats. We've already spoken about them in terms of insulin and and its combination. But what we're the scientific literature is pretty clear that it's high glycemic, meaning making your blood sugar jump, processed carbohydrates that are um, very very disease causing. So care should be taken to eat only a limited amount 
of higher glycemic carbs like white rice and white potatoes and to eat them with a meal that includes plenty of greens, beans, nuts, and seeds. So getting those healthy fats with all the most nutrients in them as well as greens and beans. So we're focusing on getting this, uh, as he says, the G-bombs into your diet. Healthier diet would include a would utilize a variety of starches with a more valuable nutritional profile such as turnips, rutabaga, winter squash, butternut, squash and acorn squash chestnuts parsnips carrots peas corn and intact whole grains man my mouth is watering just thinking about the variety there of different types of starches that you can enjoy so how do you suggest how what are some suggestions about reducing the glycemic load of your food well use beans in place of other carbohydrate rich foods and i've certainly incorporated this into into my suggestions for sure that you know if you want to have sort of a carb rich meal then then go for beans and I, I must say that there's a lot of controversy again with lectins and beans and Dr. Furman actually does pressure cook his beans um, several authorities suggest that you should pressure cook your beans notably a Dr. Stephen Gundry of Plant Paradox fame because you can get rid of some of these irritating lectins by pressure cooking them and in a recent interview uh, Dr. Furman mentioned that he does pressure cook his beans using more green vegetables both raw and cooked and using more nuts and seeds in place of carbohydrate rich foods there's no fear here of the fat in these healthy fats understanding the glycemic load we have here white potato very very high white rice white pasta chocolate cake corn sweet potato grapes roll just an example of the higher glycemic index and down here You'll see the beans start to come in, and strawberries are fabulous. They, they're sweet, and they don't make your blood sugar go up that much. Uh, even cashews that have a moderate carbohydrate in, uh, count still don't have a high glycemic index. And uh, this just gives you sort of an idea of looking at common foods. So what about, uh, have there ever been matchups? Well, there was a matchup, and a matchup meaning a study that compared beans versus whole grains. So there were two groups. One added one cup of beans and the other one cup of whole grains. So what was the result? I think you already know, but here's a, ch here's a chart from that study. So the whole grain group, there was a small increase in fiber. Uh, the bean group, high increase. Glycemic load reduction, wow, 48 versus minus 5. Hemoglobin A1C, which is a measure of your blood sugar over the last 90 days, 0.5. That's actually very, that's that's a huge reduction. Um, 0.3 here, not bad. Body weight, 5.7 pounds versus 4.4 pounds. Fasting glucose, wow, minus 9. Triglycerides, incredible. A lot of people with what are what's called metabolic syndrome, who have high cholesterol and high triglycerides and some high blood sugar, 21 points my goodness that's incredible cholesterol nine amazing and blood pressure reduction so that's um that was significant so amazingly across a broad spectrum of regions and ethnicities beans and legumes have been found to be the most consistent and reliable predictor of longevity eating more beans as a replacement for other foods simply aids all metabolic parameters that enhance cardiovascular health and as a caveat, again, he no longer recommends brown rice, as we spoke about before. Very cool stuff. So what are the problems with high glycemic foods? Well, when you eat white rice, white flour, honey, maple syrup, your blood sugar spikes, triggering the pancreas to produce insulin. We know this. The term high glycemic refers to the speed by which glucose enters the bloodstream. And in and as an example, in a meta-analysis where they looked at 39 different studies, a diet supplying a high glycemic load was associated with an increased risk of colorectal and endometrial cancers. And a meta-analysis of 10 studies demonstrated a link between higher glycemic load and, and breast cancer. Another study that for every 100 grams of white rice consumed per day, breast cancer risk, risk increased 19%, whereas the same amount of whole grains, brown rice, or beans had almost the opposite effect. Now, that's probably a U.S.-based study. Obviously, there are cultures that eat a lot of white rice with low breast cancer risk, namely Japan. But there are obviously other factors involved in, in diets in general. And so, again, Dr. Furman does rely a lot on these epidemiological studies. 
and we'll talk not so much about too much about the downsides to looking at just looking at uh, epidemiological studies but uh, we'll talk about how to sort of analyze these things overall in just a moment so stay tuned okay let's close this down and talk a little bit about resistant starch uh, I have a pretty good, I think, video on resistant starch that I'll provide a link to in the uh, show notes. While most starch is broken down by digestive enzymes converted into simple sugars and absorbed in the small intestine, resistant starch is more like a fiber. Uh, United Nations and, and World Health Organization stated that the discovery of resistant starch is one of the major developments in our understanding of the importance of carbohydrates for health in the past 20 years. So what are the benefits of resistant starch? Well, they encourage the growth of beneficial bacteria, like a prebiotic fiber, uh, which reduces intestinal pH, bile acids, and ammonia. And when fermented by bacteria, they form short-chain fatty acids, which reduce body fat storage, but they also provide fuel for the gut lining. And it reduces the glycemic effect of other foods even when eat, eating at separate meals, that's amazing. Obviously, we can rationally understand that if you're combining resistant starch with high glycemic foods, that is some, that's going to blunt sort of the glycemic effect because you're adding fiber to that. But you're actually seeing reduction of glycemic effect even when eating at separate meals, which is amazing. And this is a chart just for your information uh, or curiosity about resistant starch and what foods have it. Black beans, navy beans, lentil beans, etc. And they go down from there. But black beans, incredible amount of resistant starch and fiber. So, you know, black beans, amazing. 70% is resistant starch and fiber. So you're going to get an incredible benefit to your gut health and feel like you're eating sort of a starchy food. But in fact, most of it is going to be used by your gut and is going to improve your gut, gut microbiome. And we've spoken about that at length, and I'll provide the links below to some videos I've made on that. Moving right along, let's talk a little bit about understanding insulin resistance. Let's close this down. So the more insulin resistant one is, the higher one's risk of heart, heart disease and cancer. And we probably already have some understanding of this, but initially the pancreas can deal with the increased production to increase insulin, but eventually it just starts to fail, and that's when type 2 diabetes starts. Uh, and unfortunately, insulin, because it's, in other words, your, your pancreas keeps on producing more and more insulin to try to keep the blood sugar, it fails, but unfortunately having all this insulin in your blood is not good. Even if for a long time it, it was sort of keeping your blood sugar steady, Insulin is not just doing, uh, not just a, involved with blood sugar. It's also a chief fat storage hormone. Um, therefore, if your insulin levels are high, and I would also refer you to one of my lectures on the seven blood tests that everyone should have, because one of them is insulin, and understanding that and getting an insulin level is is important. But it's in a fat storage hormone, so it prevents you from losing body fat. It prevents your body from going into burning into the burning fat mode. Uh, besides allowing uptake of glucose into cells, it inhibits lipolysis, breaking down fat. And therefore, when your insulin levels are high, it's very hard for you to lose weight. And a lot of people, even people who go on a keto diet, if, if their insulin levels have been super high for a long period of time, it can be very difficult for them to get into ketosis because because their insulin levels are so high. And things like cheese and animal protein are going to make these your insulin level very, very high, as well as, of course, high glycemic uh, foods. So, so we have an understanding now of the problems with insulin excess. Glucose and insulin surges have a dual negative effect on apoptosis, which is the program cell death that we all need in our bodies. Insulin resistance can increase fatty liver, death of liver and pancreatic cells, and create loss of organ function and accelerate the progression of diabetes. Also leads to increased IGF-1, uh, which we'll talk about in just a moment, and also is going to affect this 
uh, hormonal path, particularly IGF-1 and insulin, plays a role in regulating CERT1 genes. And these genes are involved in repairing DNA damage. And gene, gene silencing that is suppressing genetic defects is also associated with anti-aging. So when you eat white flour, white rice, sweets, you don't lose weight even with lower caloric intake. Well, if you eat low enough, you, you are going to get some weight loss. But again, if your insulin levels are very, very high, it's going to be very difficult for you, for you to break down body fat. But uh, I'm not sure I, I necessarily think there's data that if, if you're eating white flour and white rice that you can't lose weight. There, You certainly can lose weight, uh, but you might need lower caloric intake than usual because your insulin levels are high. Not that I'm recommending that, of course. So all excess calories are pro-inflammatory. It's a good thing to understand. And this is going, just the inflammation in general, like we spoke about the fat, the, that visceral fat is, is basically going to interfere with effective insulin function, enhancing insulin resistance and increasing insulin production further. Poor diet with more animal products and processed foods and less colored Plant foods favors a pro-inflammatory microbiome, which also contributes to insulin resistance. So can you restore insulin sensitivity before getting rid of fat? Yeah, it's well known that dietary excellence with calorie restriction can rapidly reduce insulin resistance before significant fat loss. We spoke about how, you know, these changes happen, can happen very, very quickly. Uh, he says that it typically resolves two weeks Type, I'm sorry, nutritarian program typically resolves type 2 diabetes in weeks or a few months, well before the individual has obtained his or her favorable weight. We spoke about that a little bit earlier, that just getting this started, you don't have to wait to achieve your ideal body weight before you're going to see some massive improvements in your overall health. So let's remember that it is a triad of exposure to adequate phytonutrients, moderate reduction of calories, and exercise that elevates longevity proteins and reduces cancer-promoting hormones, which is the only real fountain of youth, enabling us to age more slowly. Okay, moving right on to uh, IGF-1, and also sort of fundamental to his overall ideas, so important to have a little bit of an understanding. And um, insulin-like growth factor is a hormone very similar to insulin, and it's a growth-promoting hormone that is important during childhood uh, contributes to brain development and, and muscle and bone growth. We've spoken a little bit about how dairy protein uh, is very potent to raise IGF-1, high glycemic refined carbohydrates, uh, other animal protein factors beyond IGF-1 to avoid animal protein. So he is really against you. He's really cautious when it comes to animal protein and most people on his nutritarian diet become become vegan or might take very small amounts of meat. Other factors beyond IGF-1 to avoid animal protein and arachidonic acid is inflammatory iron, which we spoke about briefly. Too much iron can, can be very toxic because it's what's called pro, it's pro-oxidant. It causes oxidation. TMAO, which is for, uh, something that happens in your gut, a chemical that's formed in your gut in relation to carnitine in animal protein. I have mixed feelings about the data on, on, on the significance of TMAO. Uh, heterocyclic am amines and polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, which are often formed by grilling animal protein. They're toxic, basically. That's why braising and boiling and steaming meats are, or pressure cooking them in a stew is going to be a lot healthier for you. The link between animal protein enhancement of IGF-1 production and increased death from cancer is well established in the scientific literature. Every long-term study using end, hard endpoints, death, heart attack, cancer, demonstrates increased premature mortality with increased consumption of animal products. Again, we're talking about epidemiological studies. People will criticize his conclusion there because they'll say that it has something to do with uh, what I believe they call sort of healthy user uh, bias, which is people who become more vegetarian tend to do other things that are uh, associated with health, like exercise and relying on relying on looking just at animal protein is uh, 
could be problematic. I do believe, however, that the science is fairly strong, that you probably need to limit the amount of animal protein in your diet, depending on, well, the category of life that you're in. So how do we decide how much protein to eat? Well, it's very clear that older adults absolutely need more animal, more protein, I should say, a more uh, appropriate protein intake for older adults is more than one gram per kilogram per day. So more than 70 grams for an average 150 pound male. It's more important after the age 75, and that's how he's defining older adults, that we consume high protein plant foods, such as hemp seeds, which uh, are a favorite of mine. Three tablespoons of hemp seeds is, is 10 grams of protein. So you can add that to a salad and really boost the amount of protein. Sunflower seeds, pine nuts, I love putting in stews to add both fat and protein. Ed edamame, tempeh, um, other beans, high protein greens, such as broccoli. Uh, for the elderly and others with higher protein needs, a wide variety of plant proteins such as hemp, pea, pumpkin are available. These plant proteins are healthier choices than animal products, according to him. Uh, however, soy protein might be a problem because it may elevate IGF-1 levels. And the reason it does this is because the, the amino acid profile is very similar to actually uh, meat. In other words, even if you increase, if you need to increase your protein intake, it's unlikely you would have to use animal products to do so. But for an older adult, there's probably no, I mean, according to Dr. Furman, he wants you to remain as vegan as possible. Uh, subjects who consume more than 1.2 grams per kilogram per day of protein compared to those who consume less than the RDA of 0.8 were more likely to be able to complete a number of tasks independently, including walking, going up and down stairs, kneeling or crouching, lifting heavy objects, higher physical activity levels, and lower BMI also contributed to independence in these everyday everyday tasks. For people who are over 75, I don't worry about consuming a little extra protein. That's really the summary here. And for me, I don't mind if they have a little bit of, of animal products. But Dr. Furman uh, dif differs on that and, um, and thinks that, and you certainly can be careful and implement various plant proteins to get those, to get those levels up. Kids and adults, they Public seems to see protein as super nutrient and strives to consume more when in reality, most people get either more than enough or too much in their diet. So the US recommended allowance is 0.8, per, per eight, per, 0.8 grams per kilogram. A lot of debate on that when it comes to various communities like paleo, keto, etc. I'm not gonna get into that uh, in this video. I have actually spoken about that. I will be speaking about that uh, very soon. So uh, I'll, I'll put a link to that in the show notes. So how much protein should you eat? Well, you can check your IGF-1. That's one way of doing it and one way of solving it. It looks like there's sort of an uh, U-shaped curve when it comes to ideal levels, meaning low levels are bad, high levels are bad, and there's some sweet spot, uh, which Dr. Furman in his clinical experience lists as 100 to 160. Uh, even after a vegan diet is optimized for protein adequacy by adding, for instance, grains, beans, quinoa, hemp, soybeans, tempeh, Mediterranean pine nuts, these individuals whose IGF is too low uh, may thrive better and live longer if a plant protein supplement or a small amount of animal products is added to get their IGF-1 level above 90. So here he is being, uh, I believe, I would say, you know, intellectually very honest um, and saying that there is potentially a reason that if your IGF level, IGF-1 level is too low to add a small amount of animal products. And I've started to incorporate, obviously I've incorporated insulin level testing into my uh, evaluation of patients, but have also started to incorporate IGF-1 levels, especially for people who are really just wondering about their animal protein intake, especially uh, patients who are trying, for whatever reason, to be on a uh, keto diet and are relying on a fair amount of protein. All right, very good. So let's keep on moving on to principle number three, which is optimal exposure to all the macro and micronutrients humans require is needed to maximize health and lifespan, otherwise known as comprehensive nutrient adequacy.
Okay. So let's uh, briefly go through this. Well, I shouldn't say briefly because the <laughs> video is turning out to be a little bit longer than I anticipated. Because of our population's inadequate consumption of fruits and vegetables, especially green vegetables, beans, nuts, seeds, practically every American is deficient at some level in these protective nutrients. This just gives you an overall diagram of the percentage of Americans meeting recommendations on vitamin D, E, magnesium, calcium, vitamin A, vitamin K, and even vitamin C. It's pretty, pretty, pretty incredible to me that, that those numbers are where they're at. DNA damage we spoke about, mitochondrial dysfunction we spoke about, results and we, uh, from this insufficient amount. We've spoken about that before. Bruce Ames, who's an amazing doctor of uh, understanding vitamins, came up with this triage hypothesis that states that even moderate insufficiencies of micronutrients can shorten one's life. In other words, basically what he's saying, when faced with insufficiency, the body uses whatever nutrients are available to ensure the most basic and pressing metabolic functions are fueled. If a needed nutrient is not available, the body compromises long-term health to ensure, ensure short-term short critical function. And I believe, quite frankly, that all of us have certain nutrient deficiencies, most likely, that is causing our body to do what it can without in other words, it's in this situation where the body is, is compromising some part of our health to ensure this critical function, uh, certainly with vitamin D as, as an example. What about supplementation in a vegan diet? Uh, I think we're going to probably go through this a little bit quicker than, than he goes through it, uh, in his... Well, vitamin B12, which is found in animal products. It's also found in in some plants, plant products, um, chlorella, and there's a product called, um, uh, it's um, palmyra, um, from the palmyra tree. Um, Sugavita is the name of the, the product, it has natural vitamin B12, and it's a type of sugar from a palmyra tree. Zinc. Research suggests that maintaining adequate zinc is particularly important in preventing pneumonia. Also, of course, through COVID, it's been recommended, and 15 to 25 milligrams is needed. No more than that, because uh, it results in some issues with copper levels, because the two are sort of tied together. So a lot of people are taking too high a dose, so 15 to 25 milligrams. DNA is... Uh, Zinc is essential for DNA synthesis and cell proliferation, like immune cells. And phytates, which are in plants, can bind to zinc. So when you're eating a lot of plants, actually, you could be decreasing your absorption of, of zinc. Uh, it's also been shown to be helpful with mood disorders. So you do have to be careful about your zinc if you're on a vegan diet. DHA, there are... I put a lot in here only because there's a lot of politics within the vegan community that you don't need to take DHA. Uh, but unfortunately, I, I believe that that's unwise. And there are also some really crazy personal attacks on Dr. Furman from the vegan, some vegan influencers, I guess you could say, because Dr. Furman sells some plant-based DHA. Um, and somehow he's compromised because of that, all of, all of which are sort of ridiculous assertions, um, there is overwhelming evidence that higher levels of EPA and DHA, which are omega-3 fatty acids, fish oil, but can be gotten from plant source, over time, measured in the blood over time, are associated with lower risk of unhealthy aging and reduced brain function. And in fact, the truth is that I, I do nutrigenomics on people, and many people have genetic deficit in converting the omega-3s found in flax or walnuts into DHA in their body. And for those people, if they are vegan, I absolutely 100% recommend when people take DHA. And you don't actually need a lot. Relatively low dose, such as 200 to 300 milligrams, your standard fish oil is usually you know, in the thousands, 1,500 to 2,000 dose. Uh, so you could take, it's just a very, very small amount. Um, Epidemiological studies have reported reduced levels of these are associated with uh, cognitive decline, and a large number of unsupplemented vegans demonstrate 
Deficiency is measured in the omega-3 index, another one of those seven blood tests that I recommend for all people. So if you're a vegan, why not? Don't be scared. Just get an omega-3 index so you can see, as well as an IGF-1 level as well. Studies demonstrating patients with depression commonly have lower EPA and DHA and can also uh, lower levels can exacerbate the risk of dementia and depression. One study, patients with a vitamin D higher than 30 showed an insignificant decline. Uh, those with levels of 20 to 29 showed moderate decline, and those with levels less than 20 showed severe decline. Uh, so this is dealing with uh, vitamin D. So that needs to be checked as well. So why is it that some people go on a vegan diet and they fail? It's become apparent from extensive research and clinical experience that a low, very low-fat vegan diet, also this is getting into some of the diet wars within the vegan community, um, that excludes nuts and seeds in omega-3 should, should ignite a spark of caution. It can result in failure to thrive, unsafe and pregnant nursing women, increased risk of depression, increased risk of heart arrhythmias for people with advanced heart disease. And the most likely observed deficiencies found to cause problems are vitamin B12, zinc, iodine, DHA, EPA, and vitamin D. Now, um, you might want to watch my video on the micronutrient uh, testing so that you can see that you can actually order micronutrient testing yourself. And in fact, if you are a vegan, I have done many times, I've sort of turned around people who have, based on some of the ideas that we've spoken about, please do reach out to me and we can get some of these, these tests for you and you can see where you may be falling short. You know, I believe that there are a lot of people, uh, very worthy goal of going, you know, they, they might be doing it for ethical reasons. And if you'd like to uh, discuss with me how to become a thriving vegan, then, then definitely reach out to me so we can do some of these tests and I can help you with that. Certainly done that for many people. Okay, next is the fourth principle, synthetic chemicals, toxins, pathogenic bacteria, parasites, and other disease-causing substances should be avoided. So let's go through the toxins. We have acrylamides and AGEs, persistent organic pollutants, methylmercury, arsenic, lead, cadmium, glyphosate, and nitroso compounds, heterocyclic amines, and polycarbons, polyhydrocarbons, endocrine disruptors, and microplastic particles. Now, acrylamide is the browning, and this is found in cooked starchy foods and has been shown to increase 39% endometrial cancer among women. Anything that is browning, you know, any kind of chips that are browned are going to have acrylamide in them. AGEs, which are basically uh, protein and bi sugar binding to protein, is going to cause all kinds of problems including vascular permeability, oxidized LDL, which we spoke about earlier, or increased arterial stiffness, oxidative stress, and increased diabetic complications. In fact, when AGEs are high, this is sort of what's causing the diabetic complications in the eye as an example. And something called hemoglobin A1C, another one of the seven tests that I recommend for people, is a measure of, of AGEs generally. And we spoke about how to reduce this, really. We spoke about cooking not just if you're going to eat meats, cooking in stews and soups for water, reducing browning is really going to be helpful. Even though I know browning certain things tastes really good. Organic pollutants, um, fat soluble, farm salmon can be a problem. Methylmercury, we all know about, found mostly in fish. It's a neurotoxin. Uh, he's recommending sort of if you're eating fish to look at the Monterey Bay uh, aquarium list, which I also recommend. Arsenic, which is a mineral and is from poultry production, pesticides, fertilizers, uh, two types. The inorganic is most dangerous. Um, we're not going to go through what it does, but it, the negative effects are it generates these reactive oxygen species, inflammation, affects your DNA, affects uh, increase in, in cancers, and brown rice and fruit juice is where you can find it. Moving on to lead and cadmium, negative effects of lead. We're all sort of aware. Here are some of the, the things that, that can be a problem. Imp impaired brain development, hearing problems, miscarriage, hypertension, uh, 
cadmium, which is unfortunately being found in breads, leafy greens, potatoes, nuts, oysters, cocoa powder. But if uh, if you he recommends African sourced cocoa um, nibs, cocoa nibs are usually less have less cadmium in them. Um, and I eat a good amount of 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 <laughs> cacao nibs, like two tablespoons a day if I'm having a smoothie. Sometimes I'll have a handful of them, and my cadmium levels, if you look at my micronutrient panel that I've reviewed on one of my, uh, where the link is in the show notes to look at doing micronutrient testing, you'll, you'll see that. Um, leafy greens, again, if you consider testing your soil, potatoes, nuts, oysters can be a problem. It's a heavy metal, and all of these because if you eat beans, grains, nuts, seeds, they will bind the phytate. So believe it or not, you're going to have less cadmium if you eat these things because they're going to bind it. Unfortunately, they bind zinc as well, and that's why it's important to be sure you're getting enough zinc. Organic sulfur compounds also aid removal. So that's garlic, onions, and ginger. Glyphosate, we've heard quite a bit about. Uh, most common herbicide, probably carcinogenic, and just try to avoid it if you can. And nitroso compounds, processed meats linked to GI cancers, uh, you know, it's nitrates essentially. And they form a formation of NO2, which is beneficial as it leads to the opening and of blood vessels and lower blood pressure, but needs to be in the presence of phytochemicals. Um, so you can have two things that can happen with nitrates, natural nitrates and you can also get formation of N nitroso compounds, which is a carcinogen, and needs heme iron found in animal products to really be a problem. So, when you're getting uh, nitrates that are found in processed meats, it's sort of a double whammy. So, be careful with that. Just don't eat processed meats. There's no, you know, you already know that. We spoke briefly about heterocyclic amines and poly cyclic hydrocarbons and we spoke about how it's basically grilled grilled products increased breast and prostate prost, uh, breast prostate and pancreatic cancers formed from meats cooked at high temperature uh, we've spoken about this before and his main message really is avoiding and limiting meat is the only the most effective way to avoid these carcinogens however if you do eat meat it's safer to add it to super stew and not grill it we've spoken about that make sure to include those g bombs Okay, endocrine disruptors, pl plastics, essentially. You try to avoid plastics. Avoid pa as many packaged foods. Don't eat, don't heat ple in plastic. Use dried beans instead of canned beans. Tomatoes in glass jars, because tomatoes are very acidic. So if you buy them in cans, most likely there's a lining in the can that's going to be not helpful to you. Uh, avoid canned coconut milk and personal products that have fragrances. Some of these fragrances can be a problem. The ewg.org can be helpful to avoid these things. So ewg.org, and you can look on that website for more information. Microplastics, of now detected in fish, it's becoming more of a problem. Okay, moving on as we speed up this process, since this is, again, going a lot longer than I expected. Regular consumption of organic foods is linked to lower cancer rate, uh, but again, studies are not definitive, so it can't can't really say for sure. Additional factors: we spoke about all of these. We spoke about oxidation, free radicals, reoxygen, rea reactive oxygen species, oxidative stress, and AGEs. Uh, so we don't really need to go through them again. And. When it comes to reactive oxygen species, they can be from endogenous inside the body, but can also be from exogenous outside the body. So endogenously, the body has natural antioxidant enzymes to get rid of it, but can be overwhelmed. That's why it's important to be eating a lot of, of nutrient-dense foods, exogenous cigarettes, UV light, pollutants, excess calories, alcohol, and AGEs that we spoke about. Oxidative stress, same sort of thing, creating an imbalance favoring pro-oxidation. And we've spoken about that already. We've also spoken about AGEs when sugar is binding to protein and how it's found in charred foods. 
So what are the two what are the two factors to keep in mind? Keep your AGs low. We've spoken about that already. And keep your NRF too high. We spoke briefly about that, but it's basically the master regulator of the body's response to oxidative stress and toxic compounds. And it's a regulator of the body's detoxification sy symptoms and the isothiocyanates, which are found in cruciferous vegetables, are the most protective phytonutrients and are particularly effective at activating NRF2. Uh, and these are found most concentrated in green plants when they are young. So broccoli sprouts incredibly high in isothiocyanates. And you see there was a trend a couple of years ago of people, and I, I, do, I do sprout uh, on occasion, but there was sort of a trend going on where people were, were uh, sprouting broccoli sprouts because of they wanted to get their high levels of isothiocyanates because it's so incredibly potent. Okay, now let's move on to preventing cancer. Most cancers can be attributed to our toxic environment. And I'm not going to go through this because we basically have spoken all about this already. The solution is having a dietary protocol rich in greens, speaking about all the things that we've spoken about. And we spoke about angiogenesis when it comes to fat, having too much fat. But it basically means when you have new blood vessels, particularly uh, when they sprout new branches, it's one of the things. And then this GST gene, which is something that has, when I do a nutrigeno nutrigenomics evaluation, we check the, this, these GST genes. And there are common alterations of this that can be increased your breast cancer risk. But you can correct that by higher cruciferous vegetable intake. And certain foods have anti-cancer effects, specifically the cruciferous vegetable plant, which you need to keep in mind is it's when the cell wall is crushed that you get this. So in order to get the isothionates and the indoles formed, you need to have the plant crushed, whether that's by chewing um, or blending before cooking. Once it's, once it's formed, you can cook it. Or you can add some arugula watercress cabbage to your salad before you start eating your cooked broccoli. And that would be one way of doing it. Uh, or cook in a wok using water as only, uh, so it's only partially cooked. Beans, of course, are going to protect against cancer because of butyrate. We spoke about butyrate already, about how it feeds the gut lining and um, helps with all these other things. And he says that soybeans are more protective of cancer than other beans, but avoid processed soy and stick to edamame, tempeh, and dried soybeans. And I put a note here in natto, which is a fermented soybean that many people can't tolerate the, the taste and texture. But in addition to, to being one of the only um, fermented foods that it doesn't have any added salt to it, also has an enormous amount of vitamin K, which is an incredible thing to help with your cardiovascular system. Eat more scallions, onions, and garlic. And same thing, it needs to be chopped. Mushrooms are incredible, and they have direct anti-cancer effects. Remember, we spoke about inhibiting our aromatase, which is going to affect the estrogen levels. Beta-glucans are basically, you know, potent immunostimulatory uh, chemical that is, you know, basically going to improve your immune system. And only eat them cooked. They also inhibit angiogenesis, which we spoke about before. Berries and pomegranates. Sometimes you can get away with the non-caloric berry powders where they basically are isolating the flavonoids that are in there. Pomegranates are incredible and they, they are both, they are aromatase inhibitors, but they also have incredible benefits for the cardiovascular system. Nuts and seeds and tomatoes and other carotenoids. And we spoke about carotenoids and we spoke about how they need to be blended, juiced, or cooked. We've spoken already about uh, body fat. Of course, he is concerned that if you have more body fat, even olive oil, if it's contributing to weight gain, is going to be a problem. Why? Because of increased angiogenesis, IL-6, which is an inflammatory component, and CRP. And these, remember, I spoke about that visceral fat releasing things. One of the things that it releases is IL-6. 
So what else can we do to avoid and prevent cancer? Well, you need more folate. Try to avoid folic acid. Um, he's spoken about this in the past. I'm probably getting into too much detail here, but you need folic acid. Folic acid is synthetic and it's not natural. And there's some evidence that circulating unmetabolized folic acid can reduce immunity and foster cancer. So it could be that some of the multivitamins, in fact, if you take multivitamins and they have folic acid in them, I would stop those, believe it or not, and find one that just has folate. But honestly, if you just eat a big salad per day, you're always going to get enough folate that you need. And alcohol, unfortunately, is not good for you, but I don't need to tell you about that. Now you see we're going through a quick review of things here and we've spoken about the blue zones. There are no overweight centenarians. People have made it to 100. The, if you're curious, the, the locations are Sardinia in Italy, Okinawa, Loma Linda, because of the Seventh-day Adventists, Nicoya Peninsula in Costa Rica, and Icaria. And we've spoken about how the nutritarian diet he thinks is considerably healthier. And I would just say that it's hard to really make that assertion. Uh, it's very difficult because there's so many different factors involved. Dr. Furman believes even a BMI elevated due to muscle is not consistent with optimal health as he, as he personally would need to eat more animal protein to gain muscle. So Lyman and the NFL have a terrible lifespan. And again, the issue here is you need muscle mass. He thinks too much muscle mass is going to be a problem. But using his reasoning, we should just check the IGF level, IGF-1 level to see if you're eating too much animal protein. Uh, experts complain that there's something called the obesity paradox where, you know, mildly overweight people have better health statistics. But it's deceptive because most Americans who are at normal weight are sickly or smoke. So they do not represent the small percentage of people who are slim and eat right. It's an interesting observation. So why do diets fail? They fail because the more unhealthfully you eat, the stronger the internal signals are that command you to eat more food. Eating calorie-dense, low-nutrient processed food develops an increased desire for excessive calories. You become increasingly in dependent on overeating to feel well. But when you increase the micronutrient quality, you significantly lessen fe feelings of hunger. Uh, there are two phases to the digestive cycle. There's the anabolic building phase, eating and digestion, and then the catabolic phase, where you're basically breaking down and using stored energy, and there's also healing and repair that happens. But if, if the toxins are mobilized, you, you can have symptoms of what's called toxic hunger, meaning you just feel sick, you feel, uh, you feel shaky, you feel irritable. And by eating, you can shut off this phase. So you know, you get to this point where you're shaky and you feel sick. So you eat and you feel better and you shut this off, but then you don't efficiently de detoxify and repair your body. So, but as you eat healthier, this toxic hunger is going to lessen with time. So let's talk about this. True hunger occurs when glycogen stores are nearing completion, meaning your liver, which holds some storage of like carbohydrate essentially, when that happens, uh, when you can replenish your glycogen stores, this prevents gluconeogenesis, which is basically where protein is turning into sugar. A true, true hunger does not fuel fat deposition, it exists to protect lean body mass from being used as an energy source. And we spoke about this toxic hunger. And fatigue is not a symptom of hunger. I'll say that again. Fatigue is not a sim symptom of hunger. It's a sim symptom of withdrawal from bad food choices. It's withdrawal from eating processed foods. And unfortunately for some people, toxic hunger is worse than some people. And the, this is a uniquely uh, Dr. Furman contribution. He's written quite a bit about this difference between toxic hunger and true hunger. And chronically overweight people in the typical American food environment feel normal only by eating too frequently or by eating a heavy meal. So that the anabolic process of digestion and assimilation continues right up to the beginning of the next meal. They need excess calories in order to feel normal. Such people are always eating or digesting what they have eating. Some people even wake up in the middle of the night with a need to eat something. Caring for thousands of individuals following a nutrient-dense, plant-rich, nutritarian diet, I've observed that the, for the mass, vast majority, the withdrawal symptoms usually come under control in less than one week. So this distinction between toxic hunger and true hunger is very important. We should understand that 
when you're eating poorly, you have diminished dopamine function. You have altered chemosensory perception, meaning you, you, know, you can't really taste your food properly. And you can't appreciate foods like natural fruits and the natural sweetness. People who ate even just two servings a week of fast food compared with those with little or none were 51% more likely to develop depression. And the risk was even greater for people who consume more. Recovery from food addiction, binge eating, and overeating. Unfortunately, without a long enough period of completely abstaining from sweetener, salts, and oils, you're going to have a weakened taste, and you'll never learn how to prefer the taste of mildly flavored natural foods. As I discussed, you, your, your palate will re recuperate, and you'll be able to appreciate natural foods a lot more. Dr. Furman suggests making lunch the most important meal. In other words, focusing on getting that lunch right. You're out of the house. Temptations abound. Uh, it's best not to eat a heavy meal before bedtime. So that, again, why lunch is most important. It's best to eat after, but not before exercising. And a hearty lunch with beans and nuts is going to keeps you from wanting to eat before dinner. So we spoke about don't think about what you think you should eat. Don't make any decisions about what to eat. Just follow the guidelines. Uh, intermittent fasting, extend the overnight fast in the evening. Uh, so you get as many hours before bedtime. So eat dinner early. It's probably the best way to do it. Improved insulin, instead of you know extending the morning to, to lunchtime, try to get the overnight fast started earlier in the evening. I know that can be difficult, but it's a lot more, uh, I should say, doable. And, and I would just say people tend to follow it more when you can have breakfast in the morning. Improved insulin sensitivity, weight loss, reduction in IGF-1. Uh, I've spoken a lot about that in our biological fasting um, lectures. And increase in autophagy. All right. Coming to the end here. Reversing disease. Uh, if you're on medications for blood pressure or diabetes, discuss with your doctor as you will need less medication should you follow this plan. In fact, when I put people on this and they are on blood pressure or diabetes medications, I usually work with their primary care doctor because it's so dramatic that they do need to reduce their, their medications pretty quickly. Heart disease and, and high blood pressure, reversing autoimmune disease, which I've spoken about, and I've, I've found it... Uh, he has a... Um, like a white paper on his website that goes through the diet, but it basically it's very similar to the nutritarian diet. Also includes juicing, heart, heart disease and high blood pressure. I think I'm going to skip this, but basically because we've spoken quite a bit about it already, but it's going to help with smoother lining of the blood vessels, make it more elastic, lower oxidized LDLs we spoke about. And um, when it comes to high carbohydrates, versus low carbohydrates, there was an increased rate of total death, uh, coronary disease and cardiovascular disease. But interestingly, the relationship between a low carbohydrate diet and total mortality was more pronounced in non-obese versus obese people. These studies, uh, NHANES, these are big studies. Um, I'm not going to really go into more detail about that autoimmune disease we spoke about, diabetes we've spoken about quite a bit. He does have people on type 1 diabetes and feels quite strongly that people with type 1 diabetes, you know, that does come with reduced longevity, feels that with, with his particular plan that uh, he can, that they can, it can be compatible with a long healthy lifespan without an increased risk of cardiovascular disease. When it comes to type 2 diabetes, we've spoken about this already at length, and it's incredibly effective. Um, he makes note that some medications make diabetes worse, and uh, specifically sulfonylureas um, get rid of it. He thinks you can get rid of it. I think we've spoken about uh, a lot of issues with blood sugar when it comes to this. When people are on this, medication should be cut by one th third on day one and then about half of the original amount by the end of the first week. Uh, it can be reversed. Depression, he makes a special note about depression. Dietary pattern of depression is associated with eating fried, sweetened, processed meats, etc. 
And 2016 research showed, documented that increased consumption of fruits and vegetables significantly elevated psychological well-being. So here are the suggestions. Morning light therapy. This is sort of his formula for depression. Morning light therapy. So getting either a light, uh, you know, they have these seasonal affective disorder lights, omega-3 supplementation, saffron, uh, SAMe, St. John's wort, 5-HTPR or L-tryptophan. And interestingly, low cholesterol, super low cholesterol has been shown to have an increased risk for depression. And so, again, I, I feel he's being very intellectually honest here by suggesting you eat a saturated fat if your cholesterol is low to get your cholesterol up. Um, because, as he says, we don't want to leave any stone unturned. Most vegan authorities would shy away from doing anything or suggesting saturated fat for anything. But I think, again, he's being very intellectually honest by, by suggesting that if your cholesterol is super low. Uh, when it comes to cancer, what are the seven steps? Vegetables, not fruits, should be part of your diet. And these should include raw as well as cooked. Broccoli sprouts, baby greens, microgreens, get them, chew them into a liquid because you want to crush those plant cells. Salads, large salads, vegetable juices, uh, twice a day. There's people who are either fight, fighting cancer, having lots of beans, organic raw fruits, uh, berries, pomegranates, kiwis, black grapes, cherries, papayas, frozen fruits and vegetables are acceptable, and raw unsalted unsalted seeds and nuts in avocado in your diet as a source of your fat. It doesn't want you to use oils as we spoke about and you can lightly um, toast the nuts and seeds. Prostate cancer trial, Dr. Dean Ornish was basically showed that diet and lifestyle intervention is effective at halting the progression of prostate cancer and amazingly turning around some of the, the pro-cancer genes. I saw a lecture by Dr. Dean Ornish probably seven or eight years ago, I would say. And it was amazing to see on a chart uh, where it actually sh where they were actually checking genes to show that some of them were actually turned off by going on, on this diet. Uh, women's healthy eating and living well study showed women eating a healthier and earlier dinner had fewer hot flashes, other negative menopausal symptoms. Well, food debates. Is butter back? Well, the answer is no, of course. And um, obviously, he's going to be recommending whole plant foods with lots of vegetables using seeds and nuts. Uh, all animal products, processed foods, increase the risk of cardiovascular disease. I'm not sure lumping animal products and processed foods together is something that I, I would particularly do, but um, he wants you to avoid butter. Salt is another issue and does not recommend that you you add salt to your diet. Even the Centers for Disease Control reports that salt kills far more Americans than tobacco and almost 70% of all Americans, including everyone older than 40, should cut their salt to 1,500 milligrams a day. It's quite low. Natural salts, sea salts, Celtic salts, all these are do have more minerals, but they're mostly salt doesn't want you to add more than 300 to 400 extra. He has a seasoning blend. It's celery seed, marjoram, summer savory, crushed thyme, crushed dried basil, crushed garlic. And you really can enjoy things without salt. And I recommend a company called Burlap and Barrel. They have the most amazing, uh, ethically sourced and direct from the farmer. I mean, amazing, amazing spices that you can use to avoid having to add too much about too much salt. And it's really not all about blood pressure. In fact, uh, there have actually it show it's been shown that, well in this case, the interesting finding from many studies, the high salt is linked to increases in all cause mortality, and that its death hastening hastening effects occur in people who are not salt sensitive. There are some genetic issues uh, where some people can tolerate more salt versus others. And in gen nutrigenomics evaluations, which I perform, you can actually see if you, if you have that gene. I will say, however, excess salt can increase 
a cytokine in your blood that is inflammatory and, in, in, and is actually associated with psoriasis. So uh, there are some authorities who recommend a very a low salt diet for people with psoriasis. There are indigenous tribes that all eat very little salt and hypertension is basically unheard of. So average sodium consumed daily is around 4,000 milligrams per day. Percentage of world population consuming more than the World Health Organization recommended 2,000 milligrams per day, 99%, wow. Number of cardiovascular deaths per year attributed to excess sodium, 1.65 million, wow. So I would recommend you start to reduce your salt, but honestly, just add ex different spices. I'll just make one caveat here, and your body will appreciate this. In other words, your, your taste sensation will appreciate this. What I mean by that, I'll just give you an example. I was seeing a patient for a rash, actually a drug rash, and he had to stop his blood pressure medication because he was allergic to it. And he came in, he said, you know, I have to stop all salt because I need to get my blood pressure down now that I'm off my, my medicine that was working well. And he was just having a horrible time of it. And I just said, please just be patient because in around two to three weeks, your palate will start to adapt and you'll be able to tolerate food again. And that gave him such reassurance. I, I, I can't really uh, explain it, but it really gave him a great deal of reassurance. And when he came back, um, he, he was amazed that he was able to appreciate food so much more now because his palate adjusted to the lower salt intake and so were you so will yours uh, this is i'll just say he, he suggests following a low-fat vegan diet that excludes nuts and seeds and all dha containing foods and supplements can be hazardous to your health increasing the risk of depression dementia and cardiac death there is an a, attack on nuts and seeds and i don't want to get into the diet wars in the vegan community, but there are, as he calls them, radical fat avoiding vegans. And we spoke about omega-3s and there are various prospective studies that showed that nuts can be beneficial. And I think all of us are aware that any sort of attack on nuts and seeds, just from a common sense perspective, is frivolous. Nurses health study and health professional study, both of these are huge, huge studies. Uh, and this is basically going through that c comparing animal, 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 it's sort of more indictments for animal products, essentially. So how do you evaluate studies? Well, Dr. Furman wants you to examine, they should examine thousands of people, go on for many years, and have hard endpoints like heart attack or cardiovascular death. And Essentially, he's relying on epidemiological studies. Now, I've added in here Dr. Walter Longo's Five Pillars of Longevity because it's a way of looking at various studies. Now, Dr. Furman, as I said, is focusing mostly on epidemiological studies, but that's only one, only one of the criteria that you need to use. And I just think that Dr. Longo's evaluation of studies is really spot on. And that is that you want to have basic research. In other words, you want to have basic research that says in the lab that, you know, cells do better, anim you know, animals do better when they, say, increase their vegetable intake. Well, you, we can say that. Uh, epidemiologically, which, you know, looking at populations, clinical studies where they change people's diets and see what the results are, centenarian studies, looking at, you know, those blue zones, people who live 200, what are they doing? and studies of complex systems. In other words, we spoke about this briefly where we spoke about how, look, you know, Japanese eat a, a fair amount of white rice, but they have very low risks for, for the cancers that we deal with and the health, chronic health problems that we deal with. And the reason is because of, there's lots of things going on. There's lots of complex systems in place in your body and we can't minimize that. We can't, you know, narrow it down. So looking at all the evidence from his perspective yes there is definitely basic research to, sh to show that you know increasing isothiocyanates those fetch those things formed by by chewing cruciferous vegetables is going to be helpful and we have epidemiological studies we do have a few clinical studies he's looking at the centenarian studies um, 
there are very few clinical studies because it's very difficult to, to do that. Uh, but, but he has his own clinical study to show reduction in these sorts of things uh, of chronic health diseases. But this is one way to sort of evaluate whether someone's research, someone's ideas on diet are going to be important. So taking, say, the carnivore diet as an example, there are probably some research to show that, you know, uh, ketones or um, high protein can have some benefit on cells, perhaps. Epidemiologically, there's no, no studies. Clinical studies, uh, I don't know of any. Centenarian studies, absolutely none. And studies of complex systems, um, when it comes to high protein intake, probably uh, n not, not much impact. But when it comes to vegetables, increasing vegetable intake, you're going to hit almost all of these. So, so there's that. Sleep and overnight fasting. There's some evidence that poor sleep impairs the immune system. And again, it's important. It's great that he's including these sorts of things. Um, so sleep is super, super important. Melatonin, which is produced in response to darkness, is not only a promoter of sleep, but also an antioxidant and an inhibitor of cell, cancer cell growth. So sleep hygiene, make it dark as possible. No clocks with lights, no blue light before bed, meaning looking at screens and various lights in the room, perhaps. Stop eating a few hours. We spoke about how you want to have intermittent fasting, but you want to do it, uh, try, to, try to do it more in the evening than the morning. In the Women's Healthy Eating and Living Study, women with breast cancer whose nightly fast was less than 13 hours compared with the 13 hours or more had a 36% increase in breast cancer recurrence. So sleep, super important. Okay. All right, coming near to the end here. Close this down. And cooking and eating, which we'll go through very quickly. It's essential to keep in mind that it takes a full three months for a person's food preferences and addictive attraction to unhealthy foods to change. Now, I found in my practice, like I spoke about that anecdote about the patient with the salt, again, it only took around three to four weeks. But when it comes to really changing their food preferences such that they enjoy this lifestyle, it does take, um, take a while. And that's why it's important, if you're interested in doing this, that you buy the book so that you ca can follow the recipes. You do not have the recipes, you're not going to be able to make this successful. I can just say that with, with almost 100% certainty because people who just sort of understand the ideas and then say, well, I know I've got to eat these, you know, mostly G-bombs and you need good recipes. And there are some amazing recipes in the book. You need to abstain from addictive food 100%. And he promises you that cravings and the taste for these addictive life-shortening foods will go away. The Nutritarian programs, as we know, is a high nutrient style, not a calorie counting formula. If you eat nutrient-dense foods, you don't have to count calories the same way. So you eat when hungry. Uh, most people obese, so uh, unfortunately, you, sometimes you can get thin and people will basically say you look too thin. You can lose two pounds per week. Um, you should have a large salad every day, uh, at least a half cup of beans and soup salad or dish once a day, three fresh fruits per day, or three servings, one, at least one ounce of raw nuts or seeds per day, at least one large double size serving of green vegetables daily steamed or as an ingredient in soup or entrees. So what aren't you going to eat? Barbecued meats, fried foods, dairy, obviously soft drinks, white flour products, and oil. Uh, believe it or not. So even a little bit of oil or a small amount of flour can derail your weight loss. And there are suggestions on how to cook without oil in, in the book. Here's an example of an eating meal, a small to moderate amount of an intact grain, such as quinoa or steel cut oats, a couple tablespoons of seeds and some fresh or frozen fruit, then a big salad or bowl of bean soup or bean stew or chili, and a piece of fruit. And then dinner, raw vegetables with dip, steamed or wok green vegetable, vegetable medley or vegetable stew, and some frozen fruit or healthful fruit-based dessert. And that actually sounds really dull. <laughs> but if you go into his book and look at the recipes, there's some amazing recipes for like lasagna and all kinds of things, not using, uh, you know, using things like eggplant and some amazing things. In fact, my mouth is watering just thinking of some of the recipes. 
And when it comes to animal products, well, Dr. Perform Furman prefers you stay on a vegan diet, but if you want animal products, eat less than six ounces per week and not more than two ounce, ounces per serving. And, or get your IGF-1 level checked. You can certainly reach out to me if you want me to order that for you. Um, and, or if you're a little bit older, you know, and you need more protein, then again, you could probably increase it a little bit more. So this took quite a bit of time. Uh, next time we'll try to make it a little bit shorter. If you liked this kind of review, please do leave, uh, leave a comment below. Certainly hit the subscribe button and the like so you can be notified more about these insights uh, and commentary on popular books. If you have a book you'd like me to review, please do leave it in the comments below. And also, please go to drcarplive.com to sign up for my weekly uh, class, Wednesday Night Live that I hold every week covering various topics. And I look forward to seeing you next time. Again, this is Dr. Carp. This channel is all about making you your own authority in health, and I wish you the best of health. Have a great day.